Hello, this is Jen Liddy. I'm really excited that you're here on the podcast today listening in because I'm talking about an important topic with an expert. Her name is Erin Perkins, and I met Erin hmm, in September in Dallas, where I thought I was going to burst into flames because it was hot as hell there. And Erin and I were standing online waiting for the bus to bring us back to our beautiful hotel. And I was curious about what she was talking about online, but I didn't get to talk to her online. I see her being a speaker the next day, and she's talking about creating accessibility in our digital products and our digital content. And so, of course, my ears perked right up because I'm like, this is something that I think people need to be thinking about. And so I tapped her on the shoulder last week and asked her if she would be a guest expert on content creation made easy. But I want to read to you her uh, bio because it's so good and tight. And just as a content nerd, I wanted to read it to you because I think we're, we can always tweak our bio. So Erin Perkins is a champion for disability rights and an entrepreneur promoting accessibility and inclusiveness. As a deafblind woman, she founded Mabley Q, an independent online business. Erin also serves as a speaker and an educator. Her unique experiences foster genuine inclusion, empowering people with disabilities. And with Erin's guidance, businesses embrace diversity and unlock the potential of every individual. And I just thought it was such a beautiful bio that I, I don't normally like read people's bios because sometimes bios are like three uh, paragraphs long, <laughs> but yours is so Thank good. Thank you. No, that bio has been like a work in progress for sure. It's beautiful. So thank you for coming on, Erin. Erin, before we dive into your expertise, and we're going to talk about all things accessibility, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to how you got to this place of being an educator in the online space? Sure. So I was, I am born deaf and I worked for a corporate for about 12 years before I was laid off. And then at that point, I was like, well, I'm going to have the exact same experience if I work for uh, another corporation. And I didn't want that. So I decided just to go at this on my own. And scary because it was not something that I've ever like really dreamed of. I was more focused on what the actual American dream was, which is like, you know, Find a job, stay at a corporate for your life, and then retire. That's not realistic, honestly. Not for this generation. And I just started my business. I wanted to learn from other people. But the biggest challenge was the fact that most of the businesses, when I was learning from them, they weren't accessible. And by that, I meant like I had a hard time understanding them. I had a hard time, like, they didn't have caption. I, it was just like, I'm spending money to learn from you, and yet I didn't have the same experience as a hearing person would. And so this, and then they would ask me how I would do it. And I'm just like, I'm actually not sure that I've always had things handed to me at growing up. So it, because school system, they have that set up to a certain extent. Now, I'm not saying that all school systems are perfect, but my parents were huge advocates for me, so I always got everything that I needed. But as a small business, I started recognizing that you're already having to build all your stuff in your business. Like This is not one more thing that they need added to their list. So I wanted to really keep it easy and simple so that they felt like, oh, I can easily do this. And it would feel good in the long run. So that's what I do. And so when before you decided to really get into this lane that you're in now, what was your expertise? What was your job? Or what, what, what did you think you wanted your business to be before you realized there's this enormous hole in the market? I... I was going to be a graphic designer. (laughs) Okay. Okay. That's my background. Like, I've done graphic design since I was 18 years old. And that was something I've done my entire life. It's all I dreamed of. I wanted to live in New York City, which I tried for three months. And I was like, ew, this is lonely. It's very dirty. And... 
they didn't pay you nearly enough and you had to work like 12 to 15 hours. It was just like, nope. But I still got to do graphic design for my mm-hmm. career. I'm very fortunate I got to work for what I went to school mm-hmm. for. And so that's what I figured I would do as an independent business. That has definitely yeah, shifted. Yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us what it means to be deaf blind? So for me, it's the official medical term is Usher syndrome. And that is a gene that affects both your hearing and your vision. There's about 400,000 of us worldwide that have this gene. And it's caused by both parents having been carriers of the gene and they're both recessive. So there's like three types, but I think there's more than that, honestly, because it affects my hearing. So I am considered profoundly deaf. I wear a hearing aid and a cochlear implant. I don't like the cochlear implant, but that's a whole nother story. And (laughs) uh, my vision is basically tunnel vision. And I have about between 40 to 50 degrees of complete central vision. Mm -hmm. So you, most people will see 180 so they can see all the way around. I cannot see the person standing next to me. I run into things. I trip over little kids. It's really awesome. <laughs> what? A, what? A, just is just a complete side note. But I'm thinking about how many times a day I trip over my dog and my cat. Is that that? I imagine they must get underfoot for you too, pets. Oh my god, my dog. Poor, poor baby girl. <laughs> she she gets like because she's so sneaky. You don't see her, yeah, like and ninjas. then she just like just mm-hmm. there, and I'm like, what the? So she learned if I'm anywhere near her, she just pops right up and walks away. <laughs> so smart. They're so much smarter than we are. Okay, so I want to jump in mm-hmm. to actually talking about because accessibility is your jam. That is what your accessibility education is your focus. And tell us, like, what does this mean for for those of us who have never had to think about making things accessible for ourselves, much less for our audiences? What is the definition of accessibility? So first of all, when most people think about accessibility, they're going to think, especially in the online arena, they're going to go, oh, your website. And I'm like, yes, that's true. But accessibility has to go so far beyond it. And that's the thing that I teach is showing them that if you talk about being accessible as a business, you need to think of all aspects of your business. You need to think about your social media. You need to think about your email, any events you might be hosting, um, your um, client onboarding, or even your if you're hiring new people and you need to think about what else is, um, just like all your branding, all of those things need to be accessible. It does not mean that you're going to be locked into a box if you're going to be accessible. It's just, you want to ensure that you're creating an experience for whatever ability or disability for the person on the other side of the screen is experiencing no matter how they view things. So it's just really creating an equal experience for everybody. I love that, creating an equal experience for everybody. We're going to talk about a little later what exactly that means and how that might look like and just get people's minds unlocked to what that could be in their business. When you, before I go into this question, which I was blown away when you said at the event where you were speaking that one in four people in the room have a disability and it's probably invisible. I think most people were surprised, but I was sitting in the room with my hearing aids in. And so I knew that, uh, I knew that I was the one, right? Like one of the, one of the four people and so I went and so on your website, you say 25 million Americans have disabilities. And I think that for people who have been walking through the world without a disability, and I would say this was me for most of my life, 
uh, that number was staggering to me. And so I wanted to talk about, you know, this is why, why is this so important now, especially sure those numbers are big, but why now coming up on 2024 is accessibility in our digital content so important? So it's really important because people are, I, I honestly think the pandemic played a huge part in this. The pandemic really highlighted how much people need to have a better experience online. And, and companies have been responding to that. Like, you know, Zoom made this easy by being able to have captions available in all the meeting. And that was great. That was one of the great things that they did. And then they made it available when you went into breakout room. Because other before, I would struggle going into breakout room because I couldn't necessarily understand everybody. And same with Google Chrome. They have the caption uh, extension that I do use as well. So there's like little things that sometimes going out in person for some people with disabilities is very challenging for them. And I'm not just talking about people that are deaf or blind or who have a physical disability. I'm also talking about people who have ADHD, talking about people who have autism. Those or any type of neurodiversity, dyslexic, any kind or chronic illnesses, all those are disabilities that they might not be able to go out in the world, but they still want to experience as much as they do. And being when you create that experience online, it really allows you to draw in the people that really want to learn from you, want to follow you, fangirl over you. Like, why wouldn't you want that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that there's a thing that happens when your eyes have been opened to something that's a problem. Like this accessibility issue. Uh, I don't think until I started losing my hearing and had to 100% absolutely have captions on for everything mm -hmm. I watched and I was missing conversations. And then of course, when everybody was wearing masks in 2020 and 2021, I couldn't hear a freaking thing. And I found myself isolating yeah. because it was just easier to be alone than it was to be like sitting at a table where I didn't, couldn't hear anybody anyway. I don't think I really ever thought about this, even though I was in education for like 15 years, right? So you would think that I would have been like thinking about all of this stuff. So I want to approach this. And the, and the reason I wanted to really speak with you is I feel like you have such a loving, uh, non-judgmental approach to this because I feel like when somebody opens their eyes to seeing that they're, oh, maybe I'm not doing such a great job with accessibility. Like there's no reason to feel shame or embarrassment about the fact that you haven't been doing it. But I want to talk about how we can move into doing it, like embracing it, and doing it without being like, oh, this is a thing I have to do, or I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I never even thought about this. Like, And so this is particularly why I wanted to have you on, because I know that you just come from this really loving, accepting space of helping people mm -hmm. with their accessibility in their business. I, I think like the biggest thing is that there are people that have become disabled later in their life, and it's almost like, you just don't know what you should know. And for me, this is part of my entire life. So for me, like, I know what I need to ask for. I know how to advocate for myself. For people like you, maybe, and, and I'm also part of the deaf culture. So, like, we have that support around us that we're able to advocate for others for someone like you who maybe lost their hearing later in life or someone who became sick. It's like you don't know what you need to know. So you just kind of like try to go about your life as you've always known it. And so when I've met so many people where they come in and they're like, oh, wow, I never thought about that. And I'm like, well, if you think about it, like, when was the last time you met a person that was disabled, but you couldn't see it? It was invisible. Like, when people meet me, they never know that I have a disability. 
unless I say it to them. And half the time, I forget to say it because I'm just like, <laughs> just like trying to go about just who I am. Yeah. Just and me. I don't like it is a core part of my identity, but I also don't want the focus of the conversation to necessarily be on that, like all the time. So when I meet people and they're just like that, and I'm just like, okay, I hope you're going to do something about it now. Like, I, and that to me is important. I've definitely met people that are just like, they just want me as a token and then move on. And I'm just like, I don't care about you, but like, that's why I really <laughs> care about the people that are like, oh, wow, they become aware. And I need and want to make it really simple for them. Because I know how overwhelmed you can get with like, oh my God, I have to do all the things. I'm like, no, you don't. Just start with one thing. And I usually tell them, start with your social. Your social media is one of the easiest things to start. Because you can really have those quick wins. And I know how important having those quick wins are these days. Okay. So let's dive into this because on your website, you talk about uh, miseducation, you talk about performative activism, and you talk about tokenism. And I feel like what you're about to share with us will help us make uh, real changes that are not any of those (laughs) things. So I'm excited to hear about like, let's start with social. What are some of the things that people could do to shift and make things more accessible for their audience? So hashtag make them camel case or initial capitalization. Basically, the first letter of each word should be capitalized because one, green readers cannot read those. People who have a learning disability actually have a hard time deciphering some of those words. I know sometimes I'll be like looking at it and I'm like, wait. My brain goes like completely the wrong direction. I'm like, okay. no, I know that's not what they meant in that. <laughs> so, I know sometimes. We'll keep this PG. Yes. 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 I was just going to say sometimes a misplaced D or an S can really mess everything up in a hashtag. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So if you initial capitalize each letter of the word in a hashtag, so Instagram, I've said this many times. Instagram, please make this easy for us to do that. And then the other thing is um, when you have a graphic with text in that you've uploaded, you need to make sure that graphic, the text in there is actually repeated in the caption because that is not readable by screen reader. Wow. Okay. I literally, A, had no idea. And, and be like, my mind is blown about these two things I literally never thought of, but are so easy to do. But that's the thing, like the graphic image thing is something I never thought about too. Because I, what I would do on my website is because I'm a print designer by trade. So like everything I design is for print. So with the website, I was like, I don't have control. It's very frustrating. I, because Print, what you see is what you get. Website, what you see is not always what you get. True. So my biggest thing was I would create graphics with like embedded text and all of that and just put it there. And I didn't realize that as a screen reader, they would not be able to read the embedded text because it's embedded in it. Yeah. So that was something I had to work at changing to make sure that happened. Otherwise, you can add alt text to it. But I would say for a better experience, adding it in the caption is actually a really good like, way to yeah. do it. We're talking about so much more than just um, putting the words on the screen as you're talking. We're talking so mm-hmm. much more about like than just using Descript or some kind of other thing to translate your words into like words on the screen. This is such good information. Um, so if socials are the easy place to start, uh, what would be another place that people aren't thinking about making their digital content accessible that, you know, like there's just a few lights to turn on here. Like there's just a few tweaks to make. My biggest thing is the website thing, um, with the button. 
Oh, tell me if more. If you say learn more, read more, and it's repeated several times on your page, and it's not clear as to what that button is going to take you to, you're going to lose that person. How come? Because when they, especially, th- this is what I want to encourage people to do. Test out a screen reader. Chrome has a great extension, although I am, like, somehow not able to function with a screen reader because it's, like, I don't even understand it. Okay. So I can't test it out, but I've had other people test out the screen reader capability and see how it down on your, as it takes you through the website. Is it clear where that button is taking? If it's not, you need to change the language of that button. Okay. What would be a more clear? Learn more. Yeah. Like, what is it? Would it be something like just being more specific, like buy the workshop here or learn more about the program here? Like, are we talking about that? You could say add words. I think some of the websites do allow you to add alt text in the back end so that you could say learn more about this program. Okay. One of the things you talk about is a holistic approach to accessibility. What does that mean? The biggest thing for me is that not every person that has a disability needs the same thing. Yes. Like, I'm okay with doing an interview like this with Cat. Mm-hmm. I don't need to have an interpreter on mm-hmm. here. Now, if you met a couple of my other friends who can't speak, well, one pers- one girl cannot speak. She never had that skill to be able to speak. But she's very bright. She would have to have an interpreter on hand to speak for her as she signed her answers and stuff. Another person definitely preferred having an interpreter to just translate what the podcast host is saying. But she would speak for herself. So it was like we all have different needs and desires of how we want to access things. So I think it's really important to recognize that not every person with a disability needs or wants the same thing, but also recognize that you're not always going to make everyone happy. That's why what I teach, I'm trying to just teach simple things that cover as many bases as possible. Yeah. Yeah. You give workshops as one of your, your, your speaker, but I also know that you give workshops. I know that you're a consultant. I know people can work with you one-on-one. So you're even very inclusive in the way you work with people. You can work with them one-to-one in a small group. You have DIY stuff for people. Mm -hmm. Um, And do you find that in all of the, the, (laughs) how do you incorporate accessibility into your own work when you're offering so many different kinds of programs and solutions for people? Because I am, I can think about it being a little overwhelming because even the one thing you said in that stuck with me from your speak speech was, you know, are you thinking about your transcripts? You can't just slap up some transcript up there. Like, are you actually going through and editing your yeah. transcripts? And I came home and I was like, oh, our transcripts could use a little bit more love. And I actually put my team on that. Um, so that was just like a small tweak, but like, it is time consuming. How do you approach this in your business with as many different people, as many different types, and as many different offerings as you have? So one of the biggest things is I teach people, especially podcasters, could I recognize you probably have hundreds and hundreds of interviews done. Start from where you're at now. Like, I don't expect you to go back to all the other past transcripts unless you have the time, unless you have the bandwidth, you have the finances to do, do so. Yes, go ahead and do that. But... For me, it's about starting from where you're at now and building forward. That's why I'm trying to break through to the small business group. Because once you start hitting six or seven figures, you're going to have all this other stuff that you're going to have to go back and fix because you are such a bigger company. And that's going to likely cost you 30%, 30 times as much more money 
and time to fix all of that. That's my mission is to help independent business owners be able to achieve this before they hit the seven figures. That way, once they're hitting it, it's like they've already got it all in place. Beautiful. Yes, yes. What are some of the results people can start to see or the outcomes they start to see when they start putting into place, like making the shifts that you're talking about, learning the tools that you're talking about, like shifting their mindset about even like being open to doing this? What what starts to shift in their life and their business? So I know a lot of people want to say and they want to hear that they're going to see a big shift in your return on investment. That's one of the things you're probably not going to see over the long run. <laughs> okay. I'm just being honest. I love but how honest is, you are. Is, the way I see it, it's like a house. It's all the plumbing. It's all the electrical. None of the stuff you see behind those walls. Mm-hmm. But you got to put in the money. That way your house is still standing 20, 30 years from now. Yeah. So... But one of the really biggest benefits by putting in the work is you do get a higher return in your search engine optimization. All right. Because you're using more words, you're adding more things, it's going to boost your search engine and it's going to keep moving you up in Google and then people can find you more. That's like, I think, is one of the highest ways. The other way, if you're a more interactive, like you meet people, you're a speaker, people are going to be more drawn to you because they see that you have, you're very inclusive, you're very welcoming. And I know that when people host like stomach and event, whenever they see captions are available, they're like, oh my God, thank you so much. And these are not deaf people. These are like people that just don't want to sit there and listen. That's right. And they, and they, it really could be um, something as simple as they, they want to speed it up. You know, that could be another thing that people, I love having the accessibility of how, how fast I can listen. Uh, I also can read faster than I can hear. So sometimes I'm like, just give me the transcript, just give me the transcript or or let me read the thing. <clears throat> That's my biggest thing about podcast is me reading the transcript. I like you have an hour podcast. I don't have an hour. <laughs> I can read your transcript in like maybe ten minutes, totally, and be done with. Yep. Get but what you the, need. to be fair, I read everything all day long, so I probably read faster than a normal person. Hmm. Hmm. Is there anything that, I mean, we've, we've talked about a lot today and you've been really generous with giving us specifics to think about. Talk, we, we've talked a little bit about tools. I do want to speak about, you know, there are a lot of tools out there to help the small business owner make all of this a lot easier. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I love that you're doing is you're making it okay to ask questions. Like I could ask you, what does it mean to be deaf blind? Because I am not, and I've never experienced that before. Uh, I feel like you're just very open and you're, you're like here, like, you know what, ask me the question, go ahead and ask me the uncomfortable questions. I feel that like, that's what you're here for. And you do such a beautiful job with that. So I just wanted to say thank you for like letting me ask you these questions. Yeah, I, thank you. I, I mean, I feel like I've come across plenty of common dumb questions from growing up. (laughs) That, but these are like really stupid questions. Like, how can deaf people drive? Uh, we have eyes. <laughs> like, we can see. Like, and I'm gonna say that I think deaf people drive better than hearing people. Just pointing that out. Okay. Um, you can, but when it comes to what state is a better driver, that's a whole another issue. <laughs> I think. The biggest thing for me was because I've encountered a lot of those types of questions that felt like when you're coming from a business perspective, a lot of the questions are very genuine. They're just like, I don't know any better. Like, I want you to teach me. And I'm more than happy to because, like, I, one of the things I've talked with my friend about is, I am so fascinated by culture. 
like other culture. Like I, I am a total like into the Jewish matchmaking, Indian matchmaking, all the mm-hmm, reality mm-hmm. shows that share the rich side of things. I'm so fascinated by it. Because I feel like I don't really ha- necessarily have a culture. Mm-hmm. Because I-, I have death culture, but that's really it. I don't really have like a religion. I am not mm-hmm. religious at all. But I'm just so fascinated by it that I want to learn and want to, and I want to ask people questions. And I'm really just genuine, try to be genuinely. I just want to learn how you have this mindset, how you are this way. Mm -hmm. And to me, I want that to be reciprocated. So if people have questions about me, even if it's personal or about deaf culture or about being deaf blind, I find it, I need to be open about that. Yeah, I think you're doing a beautiful job. Can you talk a little bit about the, uh, the, the social media accessibility scorecard that people can grab from you, which I will put the link to this in yeah. the show notes, but this is, a, this is a gem that I think people should download. So this social media scorecard is so easy. It's a quick win. You can literally go through it and just like check it, check what you are doing. If you're not doing something, there's some instruction how to do something. You can probably find some of my information on Instagram. And it, to me, it's one of those super easy wins that you can get yeah. with being a stuff. You've just, and you've also given us so many wins that we can do today. And I'm sure there's like so much more that we can dive into once we get into your world. How can people find you? I know you're on Instagram and LinkedIn. What's your Instagram they can handle? find me on Instagram. Yeah. Um, LinkedIn, my website, you, my Instagram handle Mabely, M-A-B-E-L-Y underscore Q. And you can find me there. Um, you can reach out to me through email. Whichever way is your preferred way of reaching out to me, I'm always happy to connect. Thank you, Erin. Um, I just want to say I've enjoyed I'm enjoyed meeting you in person. I loved reconnecting here. And I think that I have a lot to do in this realm. And, uh, you know, it's it's something I, I'm hoping that listeners can just like make one small change and not stress themselves out like, oh, I've been screwing up. I screwed the whole thing up. I need to go back and redo everything. Just yeah. like if, if people can just take the one big thing that you said was start where you are right now, make small changes and build on yeah. them every day. Uh, I think that that's all we can really expect of ourselves right now. So I just want to say thank you for being so open and like, so making this so much easier than it, than it uh, might feel otherwise. Thank you for having me. You asked them really great questions. Oh, thanks. Yay. Gold star for me. I love a good gold star. (laughs) All right. Come back next time when we're going to be having more conversations about how to make our content easier for us to make and better for our audience to consume. We'll see you next time. Bye.